what the Lord has prepared for us this morning. We've already had a blessed time, those of us that were here for United Prayer. If you weren't here, you'll not want to miss tomorrow morning. Uh, Brother Jem shares a little uh, testimony of what God is doing and how God is challenging him and his life. And then we have United Prayer together, which is an amazing and awesome experience. Um, just want to remind everyone, if you haven't stopped by registration, please do so. We have um, we have the offering list there for um, our prayer times. And then also we have a, a, it's working, praise the Lord, that was another technical problem we were having. So anyway, God is good. Um, yeah, we have the, we also have a sheet there for prayer requests. If you hear someone mention something and the Lord says to you, pray for that. And you want to remember and write it down. Uh, that's what we've decided to do to help facilitate that. And then also we have some brochures and booklets out, out there um, available if you want to take. And there are some things for sale. Tim has brought some things from Butterfly Paradise. So if you want to help support that ministry in Cambodia specifically, he'll be putting those out. I don't think they're out there yet because he just brought them this morning. So um, we'll be putting those out at some point today. And then we also some, have some handicrafts from Laos and Thailand. So if you'd like to stop and, uh, and see what's there, what you might like to take home with you. Oh, yes. If we have any Southern students that would like worship credit, you need to stop by registration. You can receive one worship credit for any of the meetings you attend today. Not one per meeting, but one per day, I guess, is what they're doing. So. Anyway, um, and also if any of the Southern students are volunteering here, we can do volunteer credit as well. If you'd stop by registration and talk with us, we can tell you what to do for that. Um, I think that's all for this meeting, so let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And Father, we thank you for your amazing provision. We thank you for your spirit that is provided for today. And Father, we ask for an abundance of your spirit. From Sharon, as she shares with us the stories that are dear to her heart um, from the Bible workers and the people that she met in India, we know that um, you have people in all lands, in the regions beyond, as we just sang. And we just ask, Father, that you will bring them to heaven, that we can spend eternity getting to know them. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This really is a concert place because I can't see you. Uh -huh. I'm glad you can see me. I think that's right. Can you hear me with the microphone here? Okay. I think that was a nod, so I'll just kind of go for it. Here we go. So, one of the things that is my privilege to do is to be able to be a voice for those who are over in uh, India especially, but we have Bible workers also in Thailand and Cambodia and the Philippines, but primarily I'm going to be speaking about the Bible workers in India and the Bible asks us to speak up for those who have no voice for the justice of all who are dispossessed I'm going to move this so I can read it here and not turn give you more okay that's better there we go that so speak up for those who have no voice for the justice of all who are dispossessed. You know what? I'm even going to get even bolder. Okay. Oh, that's better. Um, and it says, speak up, judge righteously, and defend the cause of the oppressed and needy. And I don't know why that's a question mark. I think that's a typo. So, <laughs> sorry about that. So that's something that I get a chance to do. My name is Sharon Williams, and I work at Jesus for Asia. You probably saw me at the registration desk. And in February and March of this year, earlier this year, a team of us from Jesus for Asia went to India, primarily for Christina Adams, who's going to be speaking at 2.30 today, and I, 
to be able to meet our Bible workers and to go to evening schools and to get stories. So that was the fun part of our trip. I want to first, before I go into sharing stories with you, um, since I'm one of the first presentations, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the heart of God since the theme of our time together is the Lord of the Harvest. In Education, page 263, Sister White writes, those who think of the result of hastening or hindering the gospel, and I might say hindering or hastening the second coming of Christ, I'm adding that in there, think of it in relation to themselves and to the world. Few think of it in relation to God. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our Creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but that suffering did not begin or end with his manifestation in humanity. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception sin has brought to the heart of God. And so many times I hear people say, and I have been guilty of this myself, I am so sick and tired of living in this world, I wish Jesus would hurry up and come. And instead of even thinking of how does God feel about us being on this planet, or how does God feel about those who have not yet heard that they have a loving Father, and what does that do to his heart when we are selfishly asking for the world to come to an end so our pain ends without thinking about the heart of God? In Ezekiel 33, 11, God says, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? If Jesus were to come back right now, our pain and suffering might end. But there are billions on this planet who would not be in heaven as a result. And that would bring pain to his heart because he says he does not take any pleasure whatsoever in the death of the wicked. Rather, what brings joy to the heart of God is one sinner who repents and turns to the Lord, as Jesus pointed out in Luke 15, 7. And so if we're talking about the heart of God, then we want to know what is it that brings joy. So this is a very famous verse. In fact, it's probably the one verse that almost everyone, at least in the United States, knows. And it's also put on placards at football games and baseball games and everywhere else. John 3.16. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so it is from the heart of love that God gave. So how is it that God loved? I want to take a moment to think about that. Let me see if I can go back to there. I want to take a moment and think about this. We are told um, from Sister White that we are not to engage in speculative conversation about the nature of God. We don't know it, we don't understand it, and so getting into arguments about it is pointless. But shy of that, I'd like to, to say that in some capacity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit enjoy a union that we don't understand. It's a union that makes them one. And when Christ left that union and became a human, he was forever altered. So whatever the Godhead was, it is not that way now. His becoming a human and retaining that nature has forever changed the Godhead. And they were willing to be forever altered because of their love for us. And so if we are going to love the world the way God loved the world, then what we're going to need to do is to be willing to be forever altered 
on behalf of those who have not yet heard the gospel. And in Desire of Ages, page 641, Sister White echoes this. She says, love to man is the earthward manifestation of love to God. It was to implant this love and to make us children of one family that the King of Glory became one with us. And when his parting words are fulfilled, love one another as I have loved you, when we love the world as he has loved it, then for us his mission is accomplished. We are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. And God's goal is for us to love the world the way that he loved the world. <coughs> Excuse me. So I ought to take, now that we have this framework on how God is calling us to love people, I wanted to also take a moment to talk a little bit about the unreached. I don't know that you can see this very clearly, but hopefully you can. Um, this is a screenshot, a little piece of a screenshot, from a website called Joshua Project. And if you're not familiar with what Joshua Project is, it is a non-denominational Christian organization that tracks the status of the unreached in the world. And if you're interested in learning more about the unreached, you can go to joshuaproject.net, look it up, and you can find out all sorts of information on who the unreached are and where they live and what resources may or may not be available in their language. So I pulled this down a couple, not too long ago, within the last week, because I was preparing for this presentation. And I also had pulled down a graphic for a presentation that I gave at the end of September. And I have to tell you, the numbers have increased from the end of September to now. So according to joshuaproject.net, there is almost 42% of, of the planet is unreached. And the number of unreached people groups is 7,151. Now, in case you're wondering who the unreached are, I wanted to let you know that. So the unreached are not people who have heard the gospel and have decided that they're not interested. The unreached are people who have no access to the gospel. They cannot walk into a Walmart and buy a Bible. They cannot go to a hotel, open the bedside table drawer, and find a Bible. They cannot walk down the street and wander into a Lifeway Christian bookstore and buy a Bible. They cannot tune their radio necessarily to a program in their language that will share the gospel. They cannot turn on the TV find a program in their language on the gospel. They can walk their entire life through their village, their city, and not once run into a Christian. And that, my friends, is 42% of the world's population. Now, you may have heard from the pulpit in your church you may have heard from the pulpit on any presentation you may have seen on YouTube that the work is almost done because we have programming like Adventist World Radio and 3ABN, not knocking either one of those organizations who are out there faithfully presenting the gospel, but because we have them, it goes around the globe, therefore everyone has access to the gospel, and therefore we're just now waiting for Jesus to finish the final touches of decorating our mansions, and when the last flower arrangement is on the last mantelpiece over the last fireplace in our mansions, Jesus will come. We're just waiting for him to finish that work. But the problem is that that concept is what is causing many, many people who believe in Christ to stay in their seats and stay in their homes. 
because that is not true. What is true is 3.19 billion people have never heard the name of Jesus, and they will never hear the name of Jesus unless somebody goes and tells them about it. And they need to have it personally. Now, there are many places on the planet where there have been great strides in, in presenting the gospel, and the majority of this 3.19 billion are in very dangerous and very hard to reach places of the planet, which also make it less palatable for getting out of our comfortable lifestyles and going and sharing the gospel because this is now, we're now down to the very difficult parts of the planet. But when Christ says in Matthew 24, 14, that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness and then the end shall come. This is what is holding Christ back, is this. And I know that we also hear sometimes that what Christ is waiting for is for his character to be perfectly reproduced in his people. And when that occurs, that's when Christ will come. But I have to tell you that his character will not be perfectly reproduced in us if we can go to bed every night and be okay with 3.19 billion people not knowing the gospel. Because it was not okay for Christ, which is why he came to this planet to begin with. And so if we're waiting for, if we're thinking that right now that we are have his character perfectly reproduced in us, we may need to take another look at that if we're not actively working on behalf of those who have not heard of the gospel. In Romans 10, the Apostle Paul wrote, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him that they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? So as I mentioned earlier, I was part of the team that went to India. And this is a graphic of the unreached people groups in, in this part of the world, but I put a big yellow circle around India because this is where I was and this is where the stories that I'm going to share are from. And you will notice a lot of red dots. And those red dots are unreached people groups, not unreached individuals, unreached people groups. And you'll see in India all of this. And then over here, and here, and this is only one portion of the map. So you can have a visual of just how many people within the country of India still have yet to hear about the gospel. So now I want to share with you some stories of some Bible workers who are in India that are... Um, their stipends come through Jesus for Asia, and they come from donors like you. And if you're sponsoring Bible workers, then you can know that the funds that you have donated are going to help with stories like, like this. The first person I want to tell you about is Tanya. And Tanya is a Bible worker in the city of Erode, and I'm doing a quick commercial. So on your offering sheets, you will see that one of the offerings is for a mission trip um, going to Erode um, in January, and that um, funds donated toward that will help offset costs at each of the individual churches. And the area where we're going for the mission trip, Tanya is from that area. So Tanya works in 
a village called Rotour, and this is a primarily Sunday keeping church. Now, I know that you're probably wondering why are there Sunday keeping people in a place with so many red dots. And that's because a people group is determined by geography, by language, by political um, interactions. And so you can have somebody really close to you there that may have knowledge of the gospel, but because of geography or religion or political views, the gospel doesn't transfer. So that's one of the things that we're working to change is to get the gospel transferred a little bit more easily. And how big is the, the Church of South India, Israel? Is it large or is it still like about one? No, small? Yeah. So even the, the, church, the church of Southern India that they have, this um, Sunday keeping, it's still a very small percentage of the population. So Tanya, the Bible workers, by the way, I should say this, if you're interested to know what the Bible workers do, they go, they are assigned territories, they are assigned villages, and they go door to door, like what we would think of the literature evangelist does here, but they don't sell anything. They go door to door and they ask primarily, can I pray for you? What needs do you have? And that's what they do all day, every day, knock on doors and pray with people, among other things like helping to make sure that any church that's um, developed stays, they take care of churches and things like that, but they are mainly um, going door to door. And Tanya was doing this and she came to a home where a young boy there was very, very sick. He was so sick and was in so much pain that he could not walk. And she prayed for that boy and then she went home. And for the first time in months that evening, the boy asked for something to eat. It had been a long time. Um, several weeks and he hadn't eaten much because he just didn't feel well. When Tanya went back to the house the next day, the mother was so excited because her son was eating and the mother knew that it was because of the prayers of Tanya and so she invited Tanya to come back and Tanya regularly went back to that home and prayed and the boy was healed, and he's now walking, and he's very, very happy. And the family is there in that village as a bright light, showing what God can do. And the villagers know that it's because of the prayers of Tanya to her God that this boy was healed. And Tanya tells us that when they first started to enter that village, nobody wanted to talk to them because they were Saturday worshipers and not Sunday worshipers. And they would ignore them and they wouldn't let, them, let her and her husband into the home. But after the boy was healed and after this village saw the power of God, then they started inviting Tanya to come to their house and pray because they know that her prayers to her God make a huge difference. And the family of this boy has been taking Bible studies. And at the time that we spoke with Tanya, the family was just about ready to take baptism. And I'm hoping by now that they have, since it's been a few months. But it was by simply going and praying and believing in the God of prayer that Tanya was able to get into that village through God. The next story I want to tell you is from Ronnie, and Ronnie is also in E Road. And in the village that she works in, and I'm going to really kill this, and my apologies to Israel here, um, Kumarapalliam. Ooh! <laughs> she works in Kumarapalliam. And every Tuesday, Tanya would fast and pray. Um, and she, as she went door to door, she would meet people, and she met a young girl named Amu, 
And Amu lived with her parents, and she had two children. And when Ronnie went to the home and introduced herself and said, may I pray for you, Amu started to cry. And Ronnie asked, well, what's wrong? Um, tell me what is going on in your life. And Amu said that her husband had left her. Amu has seizures, perhaps from epilepsy, and they came on quite often, and his parents encouraged him to leave and go find another wife, one that was not sick, one that could bring honor to the home. And so he, has, he had left and gone away to a city far away to work and to move on with his life. Little did he know that Ronnie began to pray for this family and the family was so thankful for the prayers that they said anytime you're in our neighborhood please come by we want you to come and pray and she started to do that and her first um, prayer focus was Amu herself because she wanted healing for Amu and as Amu's health um, became better her spiritual life became better and Amu fell in love with Jesus and the family then said well why don't we start praying for the husband so every Tuesday Amu and her family would fast along with Ronnie and they would pray for the husband in the far off city and one Tuesday, Ronnie was not able to go to Amu's house for some scheduling reason, but Amu called her that night in tears. And by the time Ronnie could get Amu to calm down enough to tell her what happened, Amu said that her husband had come home that day. So the very next day, Ronnie went and the husband had had a complete change of heart. He no, was no longer concerned about his wife's um, health. All he wanted was for the family to be together, and he took a huge cut in pay so that he could come home, and he actually thanked Ronnie for praying for him and praying for the family. And so this family also has been baptized and is now in the church because of prayer. This is Monogory. And is this the Monogory that talked to Pastor Padmanapan too? Or is there another? This is the one? Okay. I thought so. So Monogory, um, when Monogory became a Christian, her husband did not like that. And her husband would beat her. And he would hit her and say, where is your Jesus? And yet she remained firm in her love for her Savior. And eventually, over time, I just want you to know, eventually, over time, through Monogory's prayers and through her life, her husband has given his life to, to Christ as well. But at first, it was not easy for her to remain a faithful Christian. And there's another story that I'm not telling in today um, because it's going to come up later, I think. Um, but this woman was responsible for bringing a Pentecostal pastor, right, into the church. Um, and his entire church came in. But that's a story for another time. I don't want to steal the thunder of whoever may be telling that story later. But she's a very active lady, coming from a very rough background. So this um, monogamy was assigned an area. And there was a church of sorts in the area, a building um, of sorts. And she said that God gave her a donation. I don't know how she got the donation, 
but she said God gave it to her. And so what she did was personally work on this church building in order to make it look nice. I don't know if that was cleaning, painting, fixing. She just said it was a bad shape. And by the time she was done with the gift God had given her, it was a very nice looking church. And then she started to pray, Lord, give me souls. Is that a good prayer? Yes, Lord, give me souls. And so she started just walking through the village and praying with people. And she became known in the village for being a Christ follower. And so the villagers decided that um, they wanted to get rid of a guy who was a terror in the village and a drunkard. And so they packed up his stuff and plopped him on the steps of the church. And they are, they are, she's, they're like, here, you take him. We don't want him. You take him. And I'm sure that the villagers thought that, A, she would run out of there, or B, that you know, she would be there but terrorized. But what Monogory did is that she began to take care of this man. And it's like, fine. I have someone who was brought right to the steps of the church, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to work for this man. And she helped him by cleaning his wounds and taking care of him and getting him to the hospital. She personally made sure he got to the hospital to take care of some injuries that he had had. And instead of being run out of that area, 10 families have come into the church because of their witnessing the love of Christ in monogamy for this man that they really wanted to simply throw away. And so people watch how we interact with others. And a lot of times we don't even know that people are watching, but they do. And so monogamy was able to bring more people there. She has other stories, but for the sake of time, I will just tell you about this man. But it's her life and her heart for people that um, people are seeing. So I want to tell you now, I'm moving to the city of Mumbai. And I want to tell you about Vatsala. Am I saying that right? Yes, Vatsala. <laughs> I'm not good at these names. Israel helps, tries to help me, but it doesn't always work. Um, so Vatsala was going again. Um, she works in Chembur in, in Mumbai, in the big city of Mumbai. Mumbai is where Bollywood is, and it's a, a big uh, international banking city, I think, in, in India. And, um, and they, but they have a number of slums there, too. Uh, in India, so you have the really rich and then you have the really poor, and it's the juxtaposition um, is sometimes a little jolting when you're when you're looking at it. But she um, went to a house that was um, the family. The head of the family was Mr. Suresh, and Mr. Suresh had stomach cancer, and he had tried all sorts of medicines, but nothing worked. He went to the Hindu temple, he offered sacrifices and prayers to the idols that were in the temples, and none of them would work until somebody suggested that he talk to our Bible worker here, Vatsala, and so he called her and said, please come. And she did, and when she got there, she said that Mr. Suresh was just in a very terrible, terrible way. And so she prayed for him and then went back and prayed every day for two months for this man. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, um, even going to like an evangelistic series for every night for a week, you know, can get tiring. But she went every day for two months to pray for this man. And um, she said that by the end of the two months, 
he was totally cured of his stomach cancer. And he has taken baptism as a result of her prayers. One of the things that we notice about um, the Bible workers in India, and for those of you who travel and do mission work as well, the, you've seen this. The faith that they have in the fact that if I ask for this, God will give it. If I pray for healing of cancer, we will get healing of cancer. And that is so different from what I see in our churches here, where we're like, okay, well, we'll pray, and we'll see how God leads, you know, and, you know, and maybe God will, and maybe God won't, and, you know, it's okay, we'll anoint you, but we don't know how this is going to turn out. But when these Bible workers pray, they are very confident God will do this, and he does. When they pray, he does. This is Sister Mamta, and she is um, a Bible worker in the Mumbai area as well. And she has, she says that she has a difficult time sometimes because she's a woman going out and doing ministry. But she says that she does it anyway because this is what the Lord wants her to do. So even if she's facing difficulties, she's willing to go. And she met a boy, a young boy, who was an alcoholic. And he, took, he had a drug problem. He had an alcohol problem. And when she met him, he was in a very miserable, miserable condition. But she prayed for him, not two months, but five months. She prayed every day for this young man. And he became healed and addiction-free at the end of the time for prayer. And as a result, I'm trying to see if he's in the church or not. She did not say I'm just taking a look of the notes here from her. But I was impressed. They know that, um, according to the notes here, they know that her God healed them. And I'm positive that they're not walking away from that, even though Sister Mamta did not tell us that. But what she did do is that she organized a, an evangelistic series in Mumbai. And she's the one who went to work to do all the groundwork herself. And then she invited the conference leadership to come and speak instead of the other way around, where the conference leadership was like, okay, we are going to do an evangelistic series here. She's like, I'm going for it, and hopefully they'll come along. But if not, I'm going to go do this. And so here's a picture of them sitting under their tent. They have... Shawls, actually, looks like, strewn up. They're sitting on the ground, and that's how they did their evangelistic series. And as a result of, of, of the work that she did, there are 25 people baptized as a result of that evangelistic series that she did most of the work for. And so um, I'm always amazed at how hardworking the Bible workers are um, if anyone's in need, they go. They don't know the meaning of the word no, and they don't have boundaries. So if someone calls them at 6 in the morning and says, I need your help, they go. Um, and they are amazing to watch. I'm humbled by them all the time. I need your help on this one. <laughs> what is the name? They're a boo boy? <laughs> I'm letting that go. All right. You see him up there. Um, he is a Bible worker. Um, and I forgot to write down where he's from, but I think he's in Rajkot. And he had, he comes from a Hindu background. And his wife um, was not a Christian when he became a Christian. And he prayed and prayed for many years for his wife to come along. But he, um, like Monogory, said, I'm going forward, even if my spouse is not with me. 
And he met going to, his wife, by the way, became a Christian. Sorry, I did not mean to leave that out. After years of his praying and living in the home and showing Christ's love. So they're together now as Christians. And he met a 40-year-old woman who had fallen as he was going door to door. And she had fallen and the bones in her hands had been injured. She must have fallen forward to try to catch herself. And she had gone to many doctors and had taken a lot of medicine, but she was not cured at all from the doctors. So when he met this lady, he made this very bold statement to her. He said, if I pray for you, God will do his work and heal you. And I find that amazing that he would be that confident that if he prayed, God would answer. So she's like, sure, come on in. And it took only two weeks, and the lady was completely healed. And she has accepted the Sabbath and has joined their church because nothing else worked for her except for God and his power. And she had been addicted to tobacco, and Christ broke her free of the tobacco, and everyone in the family is now tobacco-free. So they don't have that um, in their lives anymore. And, and it's amazing, again, to hear how God manifests himself so openly and powerfully for the, for the prayer of faith. And I... I would love for all of us to be able to join in the confidence and the power of prayer that these Bible workers have. And we would see such a change in our churches. We would see a change in our communities. We would see a change in missions if we, could, if we would approach God with this kind of faith and confidence. I want to tell you a story about J.S. Seeley. She is a Bible worker in Udamal Pet, um, and I was able to uh, meet her. And I, I love this story because we were right there in the middle of it. When she was working um, in the area of Indranagar and Kadatur, she met a woman, a family, where the husband's name was Magesh, and the wife's name was Mageshvidi. And Mageshvidi was distraught because she had not had children in three years of marriage. And for her village, not having children was a sign of bad luck. And they had been um, urging the husband to leave her and go find a wife who could produce children. And the villagers were mistreating her and laughing at her. So if you're, you know, this reminds me of the Bible story of Rachel and Leah, where um, Rachel could not have children, Leah could, and Leah made life difficult for Rachel because Rachel, um, it looked as though God's disfavor was on her. And J. Seeley, with her faith in God, said to Megeshvidi, don't you worry, God will give you a child. Believe on Jesus Christ. God will give you a gift because the Bible says that children are a gift from heaven and God will bless your womb. And so they prayed. And I am happy to report that God answered that prayer. And this is a picture of Megeshvidi and her baby boy. And we got to meet her and the baby boy. But what was most fun for me is that Mageshvidi knew that we were coming. The Jayasili had told her. And so they did not, she did not name her baby. So she wanted John Wood to do it. So here's a picture. It's dark, but here's a picture of John and the baby and Mageshvidi right there. So we had the opportunity of watching John dedicate that baby to Christ and name him. And we thought he was going to name him James, 
after his son, but he did not. He named the baby Samuel because of Hannah, who had cried and prayed for a baby. And that was really a very special time to be able to watch God answer this prayer. The next story that I want to share with you, and I think this is probably my last story, is about Romani. And I love the fact, I love this story, because um, Romani had a, had a desire to meet the people in the village where she was assigned, but she didn't know how to do it. And she prayed and said, God, I don't know how to reach these people. They don't want to hear about you. What can I do? So God gave her a very fun plan. And if you're sitting out there wanting to know what you can do for Christ, ask him. And then see what fun things he'll give you. So I don't know that you can see this, but I will point it out. This is a metal stick right here. That's Israel. This is a metal stick right here. And at the end of it, she has a cookie cutter thing. And it looks like that similar to that, and this is what is used to make rose cookies. So Romani goes door to door with a bag of rice flour and her rose cookie form, knocks on the door and says, Hi, I'm Romani. May I use your kitchen? And the people are like, um, okay. So she comes in. She takes over the kitchen. She uses her own flour. She uses her own tool. She gathers children around her. She makes these cookies. And then she starts giving them away. And then, of course, the kids who are there are like, wait a second, I've got friends who really need this. And so the kids go out, find their friends, and come running back to the house. And then the parents are like, wait a second, where are all these kids going? We need to find out what's happening. And so they all land in the house. And there's Romani handing out all these cookies, freshly made rose cookies. And then when they're done, she asks them, she and her husband together do this. And she says to them, may we pray with you. And they're sitting there with, you know, like the sugar all over their faces. And what are they going to say? They say, yes, please pray. And so there they read a chapter of the Bible, and they pray for the people who are there. And she says, as a result of this ministry, she has captured seven families for Christ. And I love this because I think that God is a very creative God. And I think that if we open our hearts to him and say, Lord, I don't know what to do, you know these people, show me what to do. He will be happy to let you know and to do something fun with you. So as you're sitting there thinking, after hearing the presentation on the Father's heart, on the unreached, on the work that the Bible workers are doing, and now it's time for you to respond to God as a result of this. Here are some things to think about as if God's moving on your heart right now. Jesus said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And Jesus is our example. He is the one who we are to pattern our lives after. And so if it was his job to seek and save the lost, our job, then, is to seek and save the lost. In Matthew 9, which goes along with the theme for faith camp here, Jesus said, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, going, phew, all I have to do is pray, and I'll ask God to send out people. I know people who should go. I love this. That's exactly what I'm going to do. But then Jesus said in John 20, as the Father has sent me, I send you. And so if you're sitting there thinking of all the people that you wish you could send, <laughs> remember, God sends you. In Sabbath School Worker, January 1896, Sister White writes, Will we make Jesus glad? Will we cause rejoicing among the angels of God? We can do so by cooperating with God in seeking and saving that which was lost. There is more joy in heaven than one sinner that repenteth than over ninety and nine who need no repentance. Shall we not cooperate with heavenly angels in the work of saving humanity? In Education, page 262, Sister White writes, The whole world is opening to the gospel. Ethiopia is stretching out her hands unto God. From Japan and China and India, from the still darkened lands of our own continent and from every quarter of this world of ours comes the cry of sin-stricken hearts for a knowledge of the God of love. Millions upon millions, and I would like to update that to billions upon billions, have never so much as heard of God or his love revealed in Christ. It is their right to receive this knowledge. They have an equal claim with us in the Savior's mercy, and it rests with us who have received the knowledge with our children to whom we may impart it to answer their cry. To every household and every school, to every parent, teacher, and child upon whom has shone the light of the gospel comes at this crisis the question put to Esther the queen at that momentous crisis in Israel's history. Who knoweth? whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Hudson Taylor, if you're not familiar with Hudson Taylor, he was a missionary to China in the late 1800s. He started the China Inland Mission, and he made the statement that the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. And a little bit more strongly, John Piper says, go, send, or disobey. Those are your three options. So the question is, will you bring joy to God's heart? And that's a question for each one of us this morning. Let's pray. Father, you have opened our eyes to the state of the unreached in this world. We have heard stories of people who are going door to door looking for the lost to bring them in to your kingdom. And every one of these Bible workers, because of their faith in you, you have honored them, you have answered their prayers, and people are in the kingdom as a result. And that can happen for each one of us here. If we open our hearts to you, if we ask you what we can do for your kingdom, you will tell us. And when we walk in faith with you, we will have results because it will not be us doing it. It will be the Holy Spirit doing it through us. And there will be people in heaven who would not otherwise be there if we did not obey your great commission. So I pray for every one of our hearts and for those who may be watching this online that you will speak and give us the courage to step forward 
and do what you're calling us to do. Put a fire in our hearts for the unreached. Put a fire in our hearts for the lost. And let us not be okay with going to bed every night knowing that over 3 billion people have no opportunity to hear the gospel. That should not be okay with us. Please give us no peace until we respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Are there any announcements, John? No? Okay. Okay, our next um, speaker is Israel um, at 11, so we'll take a break now.